So I'm here with Caro Aravalo. Caro, how are you doing? Welcome to the Cosm I'm Podcast. Good. Thank you so much, Tyler. I'm so happy to be here, um, ready to talk with you. The last time we had a conversation, I was just so inspired afterwards, and it mm -hmm. really gave me a lot of food for thought. So, yeah, I'm excited. Well, I'm I'm excited to explore uh, some of the things you know that are so uh, common in your work, like mandalas, some of the things that we have talked about before. Um, but before mm -hmm. we get into that. Um, can we hear a little bit about you and your background as an artist? Absolutely. So I am Carlo Arevalo. I'm from Peru. And right now I live in Brooklyn. I've been here for the past seven years, almost seven years in a few weeks. Um, and I, well, when I went to art school, I really wasn't sure why I was there. I just had this very big intuitive feeling that I wanted to switch careers from management to arts. And it was like the first big leap of faith that I ever took. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I just followed my intuition pretty deeply on that one. And during art school, I wasn't really making the type of artwork that I do nowadays. But it was when I started both getting more connected to the natural world as well as to rituals, ceremony, um, inner healing, plant medicine, and all of that, that my artwork made a huge shift. And the artwork that I do nowadays is founded, like my foundations have always been ritual, ceremony, spirituality, and the connection to the natural kingdoms. So my work talks a lot about how our inner worlds and the outer worlds are all connected, how spirituality, energy, frequency is part of also the scientific look and the biological aspect on all of the living creatures in our world. And yeah, I do a lot of mandalas that's the vis visual um like the visual archetype that my artwork has and we i'm sure we'll dive deeper into it but that's not something that i planned and none nothing in my artwork was something that i planned i i wasn't like oh i want to do mandalas because a b and c it just started flowing through me mm -hmm. so yeah i just feel that this artwork is something that I really appreciate. I feel it's something pretty playful for me because it's not something that comes from my mind. It's just like flowing through me, just like the mm -hmm. sacred mirror that you have behind you, just like this toroidal shape of energy that is coming and I'm just part of the whole flow. So that's a little bit about yeah. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. I mean, your your work is so unique. And I want to hear a little bit more about um, your use of mandalas. You know, it, it is mm. it is something that kind of came through you and just kind of dripped out of you. And that is something that Carl Jung noticed about the mandala, that they're kind of spontaneously generated out of the human imagination. And they mm -hmm. have appeared in so many cultures throughout space and time. They're most prominent in Buddhism. I think a lot mm -hmm. of people are very familiar with Tibetan uh, sand mandalas, but they are also in Christianity, a lot of mandalas appear in stained glass windows. And even mm -hmm. Mesoamerican, like the Aztecs and the Mayans, they had mandalas and they mm -hmm. used this structure for their calendars. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's interesting to see the way they thought about time kind of in this circular way. What, what do you make of the mandalic structure? Uh, what have you learned about them from incorporating them into your work and kind of seeing them mm. come through you in almost all of the pieces that you create? So the mandalic shape started appearing in my artwork after I sat down in ceremony for the first time. I went to a temascal, which is this hot lodge where you are guided by a shaman with plant medicine smudged so you're just breathing the plant medicine and right after that my artwork 
shifted and I started drawing all these mandalic looking shapes, eyes, dots. It was just like this flow of energy and frequency coming out. And at that point, I really didn't know much about either the Mayan calendars or the um, the Hindu yantras or the Buddhist mm -hmm. sand mandalas or anything of the sort. It was just this like free flow that I was connecting to deeply. Um, and while I was painting them, I was diving into this deep meditation and this deep healing within myself. And, you know, in art school, some art schools, like the one that I went to, whenever you are making something, you need to know why you're making it. So they really want theory behind mm -hmm. the artwork. And at that point, I really didn't know why I was making these mandalic looking shapes And it was thanks to a text by Carl Jung that I was able to give them some theory um, backing up my work. And exactly what you just said, it was Carl Jung and his mandalic paintings and his connection in between the mandalic artwork and the meditative introspective aspect that gave me permission to start diving deeper into my own creations. And I find it pretty interesting that mandalas are just repeated throughout, not only throughout nature, but also throughout different ancient cultures around the world, including Hinduism, Buddhism, Mesoamerican, like the Mayan calendar that you just mentioned. And I find it fascinating that it's not only related to spirituality and religions throughout these ancient cultures, but actually we can also find mandalic looking artwork in science when we see the phylogenetics of science they are using mandalas and this circular motion coming from the mm -hmm. inside out in order to explain the evolution of different kingdoms of different different divisions different beings and i just find it fascinating that This was something that I didn't study and then decided to work on, but it was just like this intuitive flow coming through. And I believe that that's the same thing that happened with the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Mayans and just everything, you know, we are all, we all come from the same place. We all tap into the same universal force. And I believe that this centrical, like, spiral shapes are something that we're all drawn to we when we are fetuses we have this spiral shape like the Fibonacci mm -hmm. shape as well so I just wonder if these might be the seed or the eye or the eternal circle the uroros that we are all mm -hmm. coming from and yeah I I I've never tried to get rid of the mandalic look in my artwork But at the same time, I've never tried to force it either. So mm. I just feel that it is, it needs to be here still, especially since a few years ago, I actually started working on paintings that touch base on the different evolutive, um, the evolution of different organisms. Uh, the last time we talked, we were talking about the painting that I finished I believe it was in 2018, called mm -hmm. The Evolution of Plants. And now I'm working on The Evolution of Fungi, which is the one I have back here. Mm -hmm. um, and it just makes a lot of sense to keep on using this mandalic looking shape whenever I'm referring to the evol evolution of different organisms. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that is so unique about your work because... Um, You know, the mandala, Carl Jung believed it was a representation of the self, that it was a visual representation of our psyche. Um, but the way you bring in plants or mm. you bring in fungi into the mandala, it's almost like you're organizing the consciousness of these mm. um, kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I feel that both in my day-to-day -day life as in my artwork I'm always trying to find not the place where our consciousness and the 
physical material world collide, but I like to think a lot about how they unify and how their division is just another mental divisions humans have named. And I believe that there is no real separateness. Our consciousness and every living organism's consciousness trespasses and it's also reflected in the material world and actually i don't know if you're familiar with the shipibo conibos from the amazon mm -hmm. in peru yeah um my family comes from the amazon in peru and i'm not sure if we are related to or we if we have descendants from the shipibo conibo i'm actually trying to make some research on that at the moment But the Shipibos have a type of artwork called Kene. And Kene are these mandalic looking paintings that women from the Shipibo Conibo tribe make. And for the Shipibo Conibo Cosmovision, the world or the universe became to life from Ronin. Ronin is a serpent, a wise serpent that gave birth to the whole universe from their point of view and the kene the shipibo artwork is the visualization of the serpent's skin and the serpent's skin gave the serpent a song and this song was the way to heal the world i'm not sure if i'm making wow. sense it's pretty abstract yeah. But what I love about it is that the Gene is both a representation of the inner worlds, of the psyche of a person. And a lot of Shipibo shamans, when they intake plant medicine, they paint the Gene, the painting, from the person that is coming to heal. So if the person is having an imbalance, the painting will have an imbalance and it won't be mm -hmm. a harmonious mandala. I know it might seem that I'm going to the edge, but I will come to conclusion. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm trying to say with these is that there are a lot of uh, cultures around the world, like the Shipibo Conibo, when the cosmovision and the inner psyche of a human is also connected and represented through the skin of the serpent. So I love mm. how they make this unification and this connection in between the material world and the consciousness that the serpent carries inside. And that's what I love. That is something that I love doing in my artwork. I love playing with the unification in between our consciousness and how our physical bodies function. And I'm not talking only mm -hmm. about humans, human bodies, but all living organisms' bodies, because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have DNA and we have amino acids and we have all these different tiny structures which not only make our bodies, but also follow sacred geometry repetitions. And it's pretty interesting because I don't know, I feel it's like these intertwined dance in between the inner and outer worlds that we've named differently just to understand how they are different. But at the same time, it's just this flow of energy that has no real ending to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in pieces like the evolution of plants or the evolution of fungi, it's like you're mapping the flow of energy that is this kingdom mm -hmm. of organisms. Now, when you're uh, like in the evolution of fungi that's right behind you, mm -hmm. uh, how do you organize um, from the center outwards what you illustrate? Is it a matter of complexity? Is it, you know, that maybe the simplest thing is in the center and it mm. gets more complex as it radiates outwards? How do, you, how do you think about or how do you map your subject matter onto the mandala? So I usually start mapping in the center. In the center center, I don't do anything based on biology because I believe that we at the end of the day, don't really know where life came from. And we don't know how we are all alive, conscious in this flying rock in space. So in the middle of my mandala, I always just do 
this eye or this flow like a planet or a cell. So I always like to leave the most tiny center to the unknown. And then mm. in the second orbit is when I start mapping what biologists have labeled up until today as the oldest fungi or the oldest plant that we know. Mm. And it's pretty interesting because the knowledge that we have is still varying and it's still changing. One of the oldest fungi from our planet was found in Australia two years ago, which is pretty recent. So what I do is I usually... Here in the middle, I have what defines a fungi, which is its cell wall. And then I start mapping the oldest fungi and the oldest fungi that we know. And as we go outwards clockwise, I try and make a visualization of how the organism became more complex or gained complexity mm. throughout time. And something that I've made different in the fungi kingdom as what I did in the plant kingdom is that I'm not going in complexity up, up until the end. But here I decided to, you know, how each kingdom has different films and then each film has different divisions. So mm -hmm. the fungi, um, the evolution of fungi is divided in five films, which are these five here. And then each film is divided in its divisions. So let's say the Ascomicota film is divided in three divisions. And in that sense, I'm not going as complexity goes, but I'm dividing them and classifying them through the different ways that biologists class or mycologists classify mm -hmm. fungi. And I, I feel that one of the main reasons why I became pretty interested in portraying the kingdoms in my paintings is because when I was in middle school and high school, the illustrations in biology class weren't that interesting. And afterwards, I've become to realize how amazing our natural world is. And I just thought maybe if you would hire dope artists to make those biology notebook yeah. paintings. More kids would be hooked up in how amazing our natural world is. And that makes me think mm -hmm. a lot about if you love something, you want to take care of it. And I believe that one of the ultimate, I don't know if objectives, but inspirations that I would like to transmit with my artwork are for more people to work in unity with Mother Nature, because I feel whenever we are in unity with our planet, everything just flows. I also have pretty bad memory, so painting them and taking the time to study and learn about them is also helping me remember and understand more about our worlds. Because I can read a book mm -hmm. or watch a documentary, but three days later, I'll forget. But when I take the time to paint them and really study them is that I'm able to remember more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, so painting these plants and drawing these plants actually allows you to deepen your relationship with them. Mm. Um, and I know you not even in your art, in your studio too, it's so completely covered in plants, mm -hmm. like on all corners. Uh, how does that feed into the way you make art? I feel that both in my life and my paintings, I try and use as much time as I have in planet Earth as Caro Arevalo to make a love letter to the natural world, be it the fungi kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom. And, you know, some families relate to each other through cooking and they share recipes my family connects through plants so all day long we share with each, with each other the new flower that just blossomed in our garden and that's the way that we communicate with one another and I feel that this love 
letter to the plant kingdom is something that was passed to me from my parents. And especially moving to New York, I felt the need to be more surrounded by plants and in one way or another, just come back to the connection and the importance of our connection to the natural world. So yes, there are like 150 plants in my studio nowadays. And wow, I, I just love working with plants, not only taking care of them and watering them, which really is a meditative practice, but also painting them becomes a meditative practice because I can only paint at a certain rate, I cannot go faster. So I just surrender to the fact that it will take long, especially if I am doing research and I'm watching documentaries and reading books about the theme while making them. And I also love connecting to whatever I'm painting by intaking it. So mm -hmm. I work a lot with plant medicine and not only psychedelic plant medicine, but all types of plant medicine. And I do the same with fungi. And I love also painting with plant-based watercolors. And, you know, I try and just embody this love letter to the natural worlds in everything that I use and I do and I create and I just feel that it's just like this ripple effect and this never-ending swirl of playing with with the natural world um they don't communicate through the same language as you and I do meaning we cannot speak English to them, but it's wonderful to know that we can communicate to the plant kingdom or the fungi kingdom through dreams that might even be enhanced by drinking a plant that might help us lucid dreams. So I just love how we have such a option of possibilities in order to communicate and talk with all the other beings that are alive in our in our planet i feel they have been here longer than we have so they might know a thing or two more than we do mm -hmm. uh so what kind of plants mm -hmm. are you uh using uh, ceremonially or just you know in your teapot mm. uh, what kind of plants are you using to build a relationship with to enhance your creative process so let's start by saying that the relationship with plants and fungi is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately, especially because I feel that usually when we start working with a plant, we think, what are the benefits of drinking, let's say, aloe vera? You know, it will help my skin radiate and hydration, da da da. But it's pretty interesting that we think about working with plants in that way because it's just like a take, take, take. But it's wonderful mm. whenever we start also thinking, what is aloe vera gaining from working with me? So that's been something pretty interesting that I've been tapping into, just thinking, what is the mushroom gaining from working with me? And... Mm. I would say this is what they're gaining. Now I'm painting them. <laughs> you know, I'm <laughs> using my platform and my time to talk about them. So maybe that was what they were trying to say. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just interesting, the fact that building a relationship with a plant involves asking a plant and seeing if they want to work with us. And that brings me to... Cacao, which is one of the plants that I've been working with for almost two years now. It's been around a year that I've been drinking meditation dose of cacao for a year. Cacao grows around where my family is from, but I never felt called to work with it growing up. So I feel that if we're talking about a relationship that goes both ways, maybe Cacao wasn't looking mm -hmm. to work with me at the moment. And I found Cacao in Bushwick from all places, you know. I've been in the Amazon for 23 years and never really had a connection to Cacao. And I end up starting a relationship with it in the middle of Bushwick in a loft. Mm -hmm. 
So it's pretty interesting because that makes me think a lot about how maybe that was the time that the plant really wanted to work with me and I wanted to work with it. Um, so yes, I've been working with cacao for two years now and I work with it in a ceremonial aspect, which how does that look, Caro? <laughs> um, so I follow the... Guatemalan uh, vision on how it is to work ceremonially with cacao. I work with Florencia Friedman, who is um, an Argentinian uh, cacao ceremonialist, but she learned everything she knows from her elder Nana Marina, which comes from the Tsutuhil community in Guatemala. And for the Tsutuhil community, cacao is a plant just like the food of the gods. Cacao is referred to as the food of the gods, just like also psilocybin mushrooms are called the food of the gods. And I'm sure there is a connection in between those two somewhere there. Um, but yeah, working with cacao not only has a lot of physical benefits, but it's also a pretty heart opening, intuitive connector so whenever I work with cacao it's just easier for me to reconnect with my creativity and just flow to say it pretty easily so I work with cacao I also work with blue lotus which you were one of the people that actually introduced me to blue lotus and maybe that was yes. a year ago Yeah, last summer. Yeah, and I've been working with Blue Lotus ever since. And Blue Lotus is this beautiful flower that the Egyptians, you can see them in the hieroglyphics, just smelling the Blue Lotus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was tapping into the lucid dreaming world, not only by drinking Blue Lotus, but I was also tapping into the Tibetan yogas of dream and sleep for a time until I found that the practice really required me to have a deeper devotion that I, than, a, than what I was ready to devote at the time. So I stopped working with the Tibetan yogas of dream and sleep, and I just kept on working with Blue Lotus, not only for lucid dreaming, but it's also a wonderful, wonderful plan to work with during the waking hours. So sometimes I would I would have cacao and blue lotus in the morning more to have and stay in this flow of intuition and just like third eye opening and these like in between awake and dreaming during the day. So yeah, I, I just love how we can work with the same plant during different times of our day and find different benefits. Mm hmm. Now, I know you uh, you think a lot about creative mm -hmm. ritual, and I know that you've done a lot of teaching around that subject, mm -hmm. too. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the kind of rituals that you do uh, throughout your day that you feel um, helps feed your creative practice? So just like I was mentioning, definitely cacao and blue lotus are a big part of my daily rituals. And when drinking them and following the Tsutuhil community's way of drinking cacao, this time of drinking cacao is also a time to thank the elements and just having this moment of prayer to thank the elements, the natural world, the plant kingdom, cacao itself, and the protectors of our planet, the ancestors. It's really a daily invitation to remember how amazing it is that we are here and that we all work in community with other humans, with other communities, with other living beings. And it really reminds me why I want to be awake today. What do I want to create today? Mm -hmm. And besides cacao, one of the biggest rituals for me is waking up around 4 or 5 a.m., um, I love waking up at this time because no one else is awake in my house but one of my cats. And it is just a time for me to tap within with myself and start my day slow. I tend to have a monkey mind. So just giving myself the time and space to start slow really helps me not 
what is the word? Like not connect to my monkey mind throughout the day, not relate to it. Like I mm. am my monkey mind. So it really helps me separate that from my mm -hmm. being. And also before I start painting, I usually try and give myself permission to do a little meditation or some body movement in order to find that my time for painting is more of a time for playfulness. Because, you know, as a full-time artist, sometimes we get in our own minds about this needs to be the perfect painting and look amazing and yada, yada, yada. So giving myself maybe like five or 10 minutes before I start to paint to just meditate and give myself permission to play really takes that other more like structured part out of the way and it reminds me that the objective of painting is to play to have fun and that I should measure how good or bad my painting was by how much I was able to actually let go and flow with whatever was coming through me And yeah, those mm -hmm. are some of the rituals. I also usually go to bed pretty early. So I go to bed around like eight or nine because I love sleeping and I love giving myself the time to sleep for eight or nine hours every night. But I also love waking up early. Mm -hmm. So the dream world has also been one very inspirational moment of my day. Um, a lot of communities throughout the world believe that our waking hours are only important because they are preparing us for our dreams. And this is just something that I'm mm -hmm. starting to tap into. Like I was mentioning, I didn't feel ready for the Tibetan yogas of dream and sleep, but I feel there is so much there that I wish to start tapping more and more seriously into. Yeah. Now I want to get back a little bit to uh, the process you go through while creating mm -hmm. uh, mandalas. Um, now, a lot of art therapists uh, use mandalas in their therapy because there's often this healing process that happens when one is kind of creating very intuitively a mandala. So can you speak a little bit to whether or not you've observed yourself going through uh, any kind of healing process in the construction of your mandalas? Yes. So in 2014, that was my first year in Brooklyn, uh, is when I tapped the deepest up until that point into my mandala making. And at that point, I wasn't working on living organisms or the plant kingdom for that matter. So I was only doing abstract mandalic artwork. And from that year came a solo show that was called Visions of a Healing Journey. And all of these mandalas for me were maps of my psyche and were maps of the unconscious territories that I was tapping into. And that year really was the year that I was able to heal a lot of like child wounds that I didn't even know were there with me or, you know, subconscious fears that we all have. And it was fascinating because I would sit down, grab my pen, put some music, and I would just dive deep into making these mandalas. I didn't have a plan I didn't really know where they were going, but each of them by themselves carried a whole journey. They were just like taking me into a journey in my psyche. And I was frightened just like before taking a psychedelic journey. Sometimes you're like, oh my God, where are these psilocybin mushrooms going mm -hmm. to take me? Like, you know, um, But at the end of the day, you know that it's worth it because it's tapping into things that you're ready to let go and reconnect us to that more happy, childlike, intuitive curiosity that we all have. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful because I never thought that grabbing a pen and paper and sitting down would 
help me unravel and reconnect with that more like loving part of myself and yeah I up until that point I didn't really know that art had that power and actually nowadays whenever I work on mandalas that are talking about living organisms or just the outer world I still leave space in all of those unknowns that we were talking about where the scientists haven't reached. I use those parts as the areas where I just let this flow flow through me mm -hmm. and just show whatever it needs to show. And that's what is pretty interesting for me because these new paintings are both tapping into a healing journey while at the same time are talking about the natural world that exists out there. Mm -hmm. And this might not be the experience for everyone, or maybe it is up until like a certain degree, but I believe that part of our healing journey as humans is recognizing ourselves as part of nature again, and recognizing that it's sometimes easier to see how mesmerizing other beings might be, but it's more difficult to put that mirror and see that in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I love how this connection in between the inner worlds and the outer worlds is really helping us see nature as our mirror and recognizing ourselves as part of this marvelous thing that is happening in planet earth mm -hmm. so how about this for a final question uh what advice would you give to someone who wants to begin their artistic journey maybe with making mandalas mm. or painting nature uh someone who has been inspired by your style of mm. art um what are the first steps I believe that one of the most difficult things to do is sit down and start creating. I speak from my personal experience and I would just give the advice of give yourself the time, set a time when you won't be bothered by anyone, have your phone on airplane mode, don't even think about posting the artwork that you will be creating because that is already making in your mind, the objective of it needs to look wonderful so other people can see it and love what I do. I would mm -hmm. advise anyone, including you and me, to give ourselves permission to create bad artwork and create artwork that doesn't look beautiful and Instagrammable. I think that whenever we give ourselves permission to let whatever needs to flow to flow is whenever the magic starts happening. And, you know, some of my paintings are things that are either dark or don't look pretty and I don't put up on social media and I don't sell, but they are really helping me go in a journey that I need to go through. So, yeah, I would just mm -hmm. advise that. I think it's pretty important that we show up even when we are scared or doubtful or fearful or we think we are bad artists. If we just stay with that idea and we don't show up to our working tables and we don't pull the brushes and the watercolors out, then nothing is created. But if we are fearful and we still show up, something will come out and it might mm -hmm. or might not be something that you end up selling, but the idea of creating is to enjoy the process, whatever comes out of it. Mm -hmm. Caro, thank you so much for coming onto the Cosm podcast. It was a pleasure talking with thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you so much for having me.